Hello, Rob here. And in this video, we're going to textually analyze the Tides Got What Women Want advert. In the other video, which is the introduction to Tide, you, if you go through that, I uh, talked a lot about um, sort of like some of the cultural backgrounds behind it. I've done that in the historical cultural ones as well. I've done the um, background one to Tide as well. And what I'm going to do in this one is specifically look at how the semiotic language connotes meaning for audiences. So I'm and we're going to look at Bart's narrative code. Right, so, first thing to look at, Roland Bart's theory. And this idea that texts communicate meaning through a process of signification. So whenever you're textually analysing these texts, we've got to consider what is being denoted, in other words, what is literally being shown, and what the potential connotations, i.e. what meanings that means. Now this can be on a very literal level, or it can be on a more in-depth level. So, what are the common sense meanings, and what are the connotations that go beyond that? Now, we also want to talk about the idea that through repeated exposure to these messages, they can become self-evident, achieving the status of what Bart called myth becomes natural to us, but in reality these ideas are constructed, there's nothing natural about them at all. Tied to this of course is, and semiotics is, genre theory, Steve Neal, so different genres have their own semiotic conventions, their generic conventions, their tropes. These of course will exist within specific economic, institution, industrial contexts. Uh, those change evolve over time of course. So this advert would have probably been designed to be seen in a magazine rather than being a billboard advert or something like that. This is the kind of thing you get in a magazine like Good Housekeeping. We also need to think about structuralism, Claude Levi Strauss. That's not just what's inherent and denoted in the actual text, but what is implied by its absence. So what's not there can be as significant as what is in there, right? Within this, we need to consider the representations. What is being represented? Who is being represented? How are they being represented? And what semiotic language is being used to create those representations? Think about stereotyping and what stereotypes are being represented here. Um, remember stereotyping is Walter Lippmann, one of the other great thinkers of the, the most important people of the 21st century. Big influence on people like Edward Bernays um, and people like uh, Marshall McLuhan and um, Noam Chomsky and all those kind of people. Anyway, we want to be looking at how people are being stereotyped, what those stereotypes are, um, what kind of semiotic codes are used to create those representations and remember that as Stuart Hall talked about stereotyping tends to occur when they're in qualities of power so some people are sub subordinated they're excluded they're shown as being different or other often through ethnocentrism which of course ties in with the likes of what well, people like um, Paul Gilroy was saying or Edward Syatt right or Bell Hooks or Judith Butler or so remember that in the past, as David Gauntlet said, media tended to convey singular straightforward messages about ideal types of male and female identities. Today we have more diversity, but in those days things were very conservative. We need to consider Lisbeth van Zunen and how the idea of gender is constructed through discourse. And that, of course, will change according to cultural and historical context. We need to consider how is the discourse, the discussion, the debate about what is considered feminine behaviour exemplified in this advert? How does this advert help to construct and shape ideas or discourses about gender? She also talked about the display of women's bodies as objects to be looked at as a core element of Western patriarchal um, culture. Now, she also said that the way in which women are depicted 
in an objectified is different to the way men are. Now, this advert is not objectifying or sexualizing women as necessarily sex objects in the way we think of now. It's not like there's any scantily clad women, there's no nudity or anything like that in it. But we can't be that literal, because this was the 50s, remember, things were different in those days. Women here are still being objectified to be looked at in terms of their beauty. The women being represented here are still beautiful. Their hair is perfect, their makeup is perfect, their clothes are perfect, they have outfits with narrow waists on it that help to show off the shape of their body, which would have been different to what we would have seen in previous generations. Okay, So it is still an idealised image of feminine perfection. It's not necessarily sexual, but it is objectifying. Now, as Bell Hooks was saying, feminism is a struggle to end patriarchal oppression and the idea of domination. This is reinforcing sexist patriarchal domination. This is the kind of thing that feminism is reacting against. We also, if we're talking about what is not in this advert, obviously what we're seeing here is the depiction of white heterosexual middle-class America. There are no black people, there are no South Asian people, there are no Hispanic people, right? They would be considered other. They are not an ideal self from a 1960s point of view, 50s I should say, right? They would be considered abnormal, they would be considered literally degenerate. Remember this is a time when, you know, America was very highly racist, they had segregation, you know, being black was almost a crime. Being gay was definitely a crime. You could have gone to jail for being gay. Right? For example. Right? So yeah. The discrimination here is what is not being represented, okay? In terms of representations, Judith Butler is particularly important. We're talking here about gender performativity. If gender is a performance, you need to know how to perform it. And one of the roles that the media has is telling us, teaching us how to perform gender. Because Judith Butler would say that it's, there's no nature in this nature-nurture debate, it's all nurture. And it's a ritual, it's something that we repeat. We have to learn it over time. So this advert isn't just selling Tide, it's selling female domesticity. It's telling women how to behave, what they should aspire to, what their ideal self should be. You know, it's teaching you what you should want. It's teaching you what your role in society is. More about that in the other videos, though. Um, from a Paul Gilroy post-colonialism and ethnicity concept, like Bill Hooks, it's what is not there, I guess, is the point. It's what is other. The things that are other are conspicuous in their absence. In terms of media industries, um, obviously... Curran and Seaton would be talking about the media controlled by a small number of companies primarily driven by the logic of profit and power. Profit and Gamble is a gigantic conglomerate. I mean, huge. They have, I mean, the much stuff they make is ridiculous. Right? I'll do that in another video, though. Alright? Um, basically, yes, I know Curran and Seaton mainly talk about media products perfectly honest but that still fits um, I guess could talk a little bit about David Hesmer Gulch I know he's talking about the cultural industries about minimizing risk and maximizing profit um, through genres but all companies do that to a certain extent I mean 
soap suds are a genre if you want a subgenre of cleaning products if you want to look at it that way and generic conventions are being used in this advert to sell it to the public so it's a stretch but we could fit that in there more important i guess are things like in terms of audiences about how audiences are being targeted obviously <clears throat> the sort of like media effects theories of people like albert bandura who of course was building on people like um harold laswells and lazarfeld and cats with hypodermic needle and two-step flow theory um this idea that media texts can inject messages straight into our brain well that's what adverts are trying to do this is literally injecting what well, say figuratively i should say injecting the message into your brain tide is the only soap suds you need forget about the competitors they're no good by tide right that's the message that's being injected into your brain right modeling we've got modeling here we've got a representation of the ideal housewife that we can aspire to it's using emotion that's another thing that other bandera said about manipulating emotional responses look love hearts right we've also got this idea of, of two-step flow model we are more likely to accept the messages given to us by someone we trust well this is why they're making a big deal of Procter and Gamble's name because as I said the research that Darcy did on this suggested that people trusted to Procter and Gamble but then we've got the good housekeeping seal of approval here good housekeeping has been going since the 1920s I think 1927 or something like that and it's still going it's still a big selling magazine selling like 30 40 million copies a month it's a consumer magazine for from a rubicon and young psychographic point of view your mainstreamers um housewives basically and if you know it's a trusted brand if good housekeeping says it's good well we can trust it all right so that goes in with media effects theory two-step flow model last fellow cats that really um george gervin a cultivation theory um ties in with media effects theory because we say the media effects theory is about manipulating people's behavior that's what advertising and public relations are doing it's about manipulating your behavior and gervin would say the more we're exposed to repeated patterns of representation the more we believe it so the more we're told that tide's got what we want the more we're told that no other suds can clean as well the more we see that logo plastered around the more we begin to believe it so gerbner ties in with that it's about reinforcing dominant ideologies not just of buying tide but as i said other things beyond that as well um it's about not just selling consumer capitalism the idea of buy of uh, obtaining happiness through the consumption of consumer goods whether it be washing machines or the tide you need to make them work or through fashion it's promoting an idea of how women should be expected to behave about a certain kind of gender performativity about the fact that women should be domestic the fact that women should be mothers the fact that they should you know be interest, you know ha made happy by their role of being in the home being domestic cooking cleaning looking after children keeping the house tidy while the husband goes out and work it's not about women going out and working about getting their own jobs and making their own achievements it's all about supporting their husband and children so it's promoting dominant ideologies above and beyond just buying tide so george gervin's theory comes into this then we need to consider stuart hall's perceptions theory what are the messages that are encoded into this by the producers and how do audiences decode that message so what are the dominant hegemonic preferred readings well obviously tide is better than his competitors that's the first message by tide right but also this is how women should behave consumer capitalism buying stuff 
looking pretty, looking after the kids, looking after the husband, being a housewife. Those are the dominant ideologies. Now, we've also got the negotiated oppositional readings. Now, a negotiated point of view, you might look at that advert and go, look, I know this advert's trying to get me to buy Tide, but personally, I prefer this other brand. That would be a negotiated reading. It might be, well, let's face it, what if you're a person of colour is looking at this? Yeah? It might be saying, I know this advert is trying to say, tell me that being white is the ideal, but I don't believe that. What if you're a lesbian? What if you're a older person? What if you're not a housewife? You may recognise the message, but take your own meaning from it. Now, of course, we are divorced. We're not the target audience from this. We're living more than half a century away from when this was made. We're not American 1950s middle class housewives. So we might have a camp reading of it. Yeah? We might look at this and see it's kitsch. You know, we like it because it's old fashioned and outdated. We might think it's funny. That'd be a negotiated reading. It's not what you're meant to think. On the other hand, you might have an oppositional reading. Now this is the main one to talk about in some ways, I guess. We might look at this advert and see it as being misogynistic. If not misogynistic, certainly sexist. We might see it as being, you know, the values it's promoting might be seen as offensive to us because where's the diversity that we'd expect in a modern advert, right? We might disagree that that's what women want. Maybe women want a job. Maybe one of women want a fulfilment beyond looking after kids and having a husband and being domestic. Yeah? Why can't the woman go out and work and her husband stay at home and look after the kids and do the washing? Yeah? What about people who don't want to be in a relationship and are perfectly happy on their own? So, we might have an oppositional reading to it. Now, this was at the beginnings when people were starting to consider feminism. As I said in the other video, what we're trying to do at this point in the 1950s is that during the war, women have been out, they've been working, they've been doing the jobs that men used to do while the men were off fighting. You had to get those women out of those jobs so the men had the jobs to come back to. So what you had to do is advertising wasn't just about selling products, it was about propaganda. It was about public relations, which we read with Bernays comes in. It was about trying to sell women the ideology that they should be housewives, that they should be domestic, that their social role was to be carers and nurturers and providers, that you know they should care that their washing was whiter than their neighbours, because if their na neighbours were looking over their fence at your washing and your whites weren't quite as white as they could be, they're going to look down on you, you're going to be ashamed of yourself, keeping up with the Joneses and all that kind of stuff. Right? It was about promoting the ideology of going out and buying stuff that you don't really need, right? So, people were starting to react against this. You were starting to get the beginnings of the feminist movement, of people wanting to go out, women wanting to go out and get their own jobs, and wanted to be seen as equal to men. But, we shouldn't go too far into trying to enforce our 21st century ideologies onto mid 20th century or any other time period audiences because whilst there will have been in those days to be honest probably a minority of people who might have found this offensive a lot of the audiences would have swallowed this message whole a lot of people accepted this a lot of the women wanted that life it might seem strange to us today but women wanted to be housewives women wanted to look after the kids women wanted to be a good wife to their husbands that was what was expected of them 
culture expected that of them. They expected it from each other. And they might have looked down on anyone who didn't want that. So think about, you know, we've got to be careful about kind of like enforcing our 21st century attitudes onto people from the past. All right? Just saying. Right. Okay, those are the main theories that we need to be looking at. Okay? So what kind of things are we going to talk about here? What is denoted? What is connoted? Well, obviously this has got a lot more body text on it than we'd associate with a, a copy, body copy, on it than we'd expect with a modern advert. There's far more text on it and less. Modern adverts tend to have one main picture and a little bit of text. They don't have as many little pictures on it as this has. So we need to consider both the text and the image. We need to consider the juxtaposition and how, as Roland Barthes said, they anchor one another. All right. So, a couple of things. First of all, we've got what's called a Z-line. A Z-line. A Z-line is how our eyes are meant to scan the product. So, because in Western cultures we read left to right and we tend to read from, well, we read from top to bottom, our eyes are automatically going to start up here. We're going to read this bit first, then we're going to read this bit, then our eye is going to be drawn down here and eventually it's going to go over here. So it's going to have a Z line, well two to be honest, but like that, okay? But on the other hand, this, Ty's got one we want, is big, bold display script font. It's in bright red. High contrast with the background. Red's a, a colour that catches our eye because our little reptile brains are in color, sort of like um, evolved to see red as danger, so we look at it, okay? So it catches our eye against this high contrast white background. Tide's got what would we want. Immediately, we've got a hermeneutic enigma code, as Roland Bart would say. We're meant to be asking ourselves, really, what do we want? And how can Tide give it them? Right. So that's our first enigma. No wonder you, personalization, direct address, you women, not men, women, that's who we're talking to, that's our target audience. No wonder you women buy more tied, big red letters to make it stand out, than any other wash day product, exclamation mark. We're very excited about it, we're shouting at you. This font is a script font, it looks like handwriting, more personal. This is a script font. It looks like handwriting, more personal, right? More exclamation marks. Action code. Choreatic code, right? So, we've got... Tide's got what we want. What's the product? That's the first thing we're going to look at. Okay? What does Tide want? Hearts. Women want love. But look at the way this is designed. Look at how these lines suggest movement as if the hearts are leaping out of it. Or pouring from what Tide has got into her. So these connote movement, they connote energy, they connote action. Um, so they again, they're going into your prorietic code, right? And the love hearts are more of a semantic code. They're seams, they represent something more than their literal image right so we're going to the historical background of them and i can't be bothered right so there's lines going out from this they're popping out of her she's you know radiating love and hearts right but you could also say this is drawing our eye in this direction like the arrows pointing at her so ty's got what women want what women these women right so we go from there down here then we've got this action code here again, this prorietic code. She's hugging the box. She loves this. And she's sort of looking at it, not as much as in the other adverts. But her eyes aren't looking at us. It's not a direct gaze like this one is. She's looking at us. That's a direct gaze, right? So she's kind of like hugging this like it was a child or a husband. Um, and again, look at her. This is not, I mean, if you want to put the sort of like um, treachery of images, Rene Magritte 
says he knew Pat and Peep kind of look at it. It's not a picture of a woman. It's a airbrushed painting of a woman. It's not a photograph. So it's, you know, it's a second level of signification, right? Um, but a very, very highly super realistic airbrushed picture of a woman. That, you could have taken a photograph, but a photograph's never going to, no matter how much you manipulate it, it's never going to be as good as the perfect painting. Now I say that, but to this day, they've just scrapped them, they're not going to make them anymore, but get yourself an Ikea catalogue, look in that, 70% of everything in an Ikea catalogue is computer generated, they're not photos at all, they've been done in Photoshop. Turn the TV on, watch a car advert. Cars and car adverts are always computer generated. Because no matter how much you clean a real car, it will never be perfectly clean. It will always have dirt and fingerprints on it. Computer generated ones are always perfect. The difference is, in the 21st century, this, you know, computers have made CGI so good that in the postmodern world, the simulacra have become hyper real. You can no longer tell the difference between the fake and the real. Anyway, I digress. So, this perfect image of perfection in womanhood. She's beautiful, she's fully made up, she's got mascara and her eyebrows are perfect, her hair's perfect, she's wearing lipstick. Who dresses like that and do the washing? But in the 50s, you're expected to, in this idealised fantasy world, of the perfect woman and her perfect life. I was going to say spotless, but it literally does have spots on it. Um, but a spotlessly clean white top. The headband, of course, is keeping her hair back out of her face. This is because she's working. It's an action code, in a way. Putting her hair back, she's ready for action. Even if, you know, she's wearing a pinny. Same thing over here, isn't it? Pinnacle. Uh, apron. Right, it's about being ready for work. This might have a little bit of an intertextual reference to um, you will hear people talk of Rosie the Riveter. What people mean when they're referring to Rosie the Riveter isn't Rosie the Riveter as you can see in my other video but that's beside the point. All right, Women in the 1950s who were working in factories because women were supposed to have long hair or headbands or head scarves or you know, whatever, to keep the hair out of their face. And they also tended to cut their hair shorter, um, so it didn't get caught in the machinery. Famously, um, Veronica Lake, who had extremely long hair, we used to wear it over her eyes, was forced to cut her hair during World War II because women who were copying their haircut was getting it caught in the machineries in the factory. Anyway, that kind of bit of an intertextual reference to it. I could speed, and that's how women wore their hair at the time. Um, so, we've got these seams, they're sort of like, you know, they're not just literal, there's just not the literal denotations, there's connotations that go beyond that as well, there's, so they're more symbolic codes, okay, so there's greater meanings to them. So, again, it, it's showing women how to perform gender, it's also telling women what they should want, and it's like saying, if you want love, then you need to make sure that your husband's clothes, his shirts for work, are as white as possible. Because if your husband is going to the office and he's got dirty shirts, he's not going to get that promotion he wants because his boss is going to look down on him. If your kids are going to school with dirty clothes, they're going to get bullied. Your neighbour's going to scorn you if your clothes aren't as white as hers. So it's got meanings beyond this. We've also got to think about the the um, referential codes, the sort of like the um, wider societal and cultural codes it's implying. As I said, consumer capitalism, heterosexual, religious, marriage, monogamy, family, two point 
three kids, two cars in the garage, the washing machine, TV, all those other consumer goods that were just coming out of the 50s. So there's all those kind of things, right? Um, anyway, then we get into this text which tells us exactly what Tide does. Rule of three, cleanest, whitest, brightest. Again, if we're going into the symbolic codes, we've got hyperbole and superlatives, exclamation marks, words that are hyperbole, they're exaggerations. Is it really the world's cleanest wash? The world's whitest wash? Where's your evidence for this? Back it up. Um, words that are affirmative. Yes, Tide will get your, your wash cleaner than any other washing product exclamation mark tide unlike soap now remember part of the symbolic code and the symbolism and part of the um, the sort of like the semantic code and this idea of thesis and antithesis well what's the antithesis to tide well ordinary soap and the competitors soaps Anyway, it removes dirt and soap film. No wonder more Tide, more superlative, Tide goes into American homes than any other wash day product. World's whitest wash. It's a miracle. It's not science, it's a miracle. The, and look at how they're putting exclamation, uh, sorry, an emphasis as well with things in italics. In hardest water got to know what that means haven't you so you better have your referential codes going on there too tide will get your shirts sheets towels whiter yes so more affirmative whiter emphasize in italics than say soap no sorry than any soap or other washing product known exclamation mark so it tries to bring a bit of science in it it's called science it doesn't mean anything actually brightens colors it says Trust all of your washable colours to Tide with its terrific superlative cleaning power. It's a strong word. Tide is truly safe! Exclamation mark. Then we've got our ellipsis. And actually brightens italics, soap dulled colours. So it's using italics, it's using reds. It's using bold exclamation marks and the rule of three for emphasis. Using words like power, literally a power word, terrific, superlatives, yeah, hyperbole as well, terrific as a hyperbole, hardest. We've got intertextuality here, Julie Christave, remember, referencing good housekeeping. Um, we've got <clears throat> these more cartoony kind of elements too, the like comic strips. So of course that's intertextuality I guess as well. Um, these speech bubbles, this generic convention of comic strips. It's just in conversation between these two different housewives, presumably neighbours, maybe with a shared garden or, I don't know, maybe they're, they're related or something, I don't know. But remember we said that um, Binary opposites and things like, um, you know, you and your neighbour, the binary opposite. Binary opposites of what isn't there, so what is missing. So there's the binary opposite of non-white, non-heterosexual, non-middle class. There's, you know, white, what's the opposite of white, not white. What's, you know, dirty and clean, bright and dark. Um... Tied its competitors, tied soap. These are all binary opposites. So that goes into the thesis and antithesis element of symbolic code. Um, what else we got? We've got again the referential code. You need to know who Procter and Gamble are. You need to know who Good Housekeeping are. You've got to know all comic strips work, or this doesn't make any sense. So, you know, what are these little clouds, for example? Because, like a cloud, speech is not something you can normally see. You know, it's substantial. It's, you know, 
semiotics for you in it and look at the way you've got the little spike coming out of it because it's put that's coming out of her like a puff of condensed air in a cold day tide that suds in whiz even in hardest water I mean, what does that mean suds obviously soap suds says up here look sudsing's not a word they made it up right whiz so we're talking colloquialisms here we're talking restricted code um trying to make it more personal less sort of like um you know there's not many big words in here there's nothing too scientific nowadays we like to chuck nonsense scientific words into things like dermatologically tested well i hope so i'm not going to put anything on my skin it's not been tested on skin you know laboratory garnier which is just saying you know garnier's laboratory it sounds posher in french the mean anything there's nothing like Procter and Gamble's Tide, she says. I mean, who says that? No one would actually say that, but what they're trying to do is link Procter and Gamble with superlatives, would be better than everybody else. And then it's got a parting sort of like reminder. Remember, she says, clicking her fingers. Well, we can't hear a click, so they're illustrating with little lines. Look at her at a jaunty angle. Jaunty angle, because angles are action codes the way she stood like this yeah bright sunny day because pleasant good things good memories anyway remember exclamation mark as if she's saying it tide gets clothes cleaner than any other wash day product you can buy parting shot something to remember colors red white and blue well orange red white and blue colors the american flag putting in a bit of patriotism isn't there yeah these common colors go together well because they pop blue and orange teal and blue opposite on the color wheel pops the net um direct address she's looking right at us no soap no other suds and exclamation marks no other washing powders so next exclamation marks, speech marks no other washing powder no will get your wash as clean in big red letters as tied exclamation mark there's a drop shadow on this as if she's holding up a really big sign for some reason tide is often written in italics to make it look more exciting um what else can we talk about um you know gesture codes kinds of the semiotic code again she's literally gesturing at us pointing at the thing remember fingers up Um, what else can we talk about? Binary opposites was there, what isn't there? Said that. Um, the other video will go into all the historical background. I'm not going to go into that again. Um, it's telling us in terms of representations. So if we're thinking about Gauntlet, we're thinking about Stuart Hall, um, we're thinking about Lisbeth Van Zunen and Bell Hooks and Judith Butler. It's telling us that the women belong in the sphere of the domestic that men's roles were in going out of working that the woman's job was to stay at home and be domestic so we're talking about stereotyping who's being stereotyped how are they being stereotyped um so a good way we can look at this was stall stuart hall's theory of representation that we've got images of domesticity at least two, you know we've got two women hanging out washing for example they form part of what he called a shared conceptual roadmap that give meaning to the world of the advert and therefore the wider world of society so it's trying to represent women's real lives you know women really have to be washing this is something you don't get me nowadays look that's got a mangle on it a mangle was something that was like two rollers that you squeezed your clothes through to squeeze all the water out of them before you hung them on the line. Don't see them in this day, day and age. We've got spin cycles on our washing machines instead. Um, to be honest, I think that is pretty much enough. I mean, remember, you've got to be talking about things like specifics, like shot types. This is a close up. This is a medium shot. That's a long shot. That's a medium close-up. 
yeah they're all very slightly low angle you're looking up at them she is you know we're literally and figuratively looking up to it as a an aspirational role model yeah think about the bright colors you know in a magazine in those days pretty much the only thing in the magazines that would have been in color would have been the adverts on the front cover probably the rest of it would have been black and white so the adverts are pop they'll stand out against all the other stuff so bright colors are going to make that to happen I think this is where you would have seen it. it would have been in magazines it wouldn't I don't think it would have been a billboard or anything like that Um, again, cultivation theory, the more you see this message being repeated, the more you're going to believe it. One of the other things we can look at is the idea of the USP, the unique selling point, which is a concept invented by a, an advertising guru called Russell Reeves. So, um, a unique selling point, what can Tide do that its competitors can't? Um, and that's where we've got, you know, this text here, this body copy telling us what they can do that this can't but of course his competitors are going to be saying exactly the same thing so who do you believe um, if we look at the target audience and we consider who they are and how they would use this media um, the likely target audience is going to be destructed to the average use of women literally says you women in it um, who are meant to personally identify with this person being depicted um, you can bring use and gratification theory into this, Stuart Hall. Um, these young women are likely to be newly married and with young families. You can see men's and children's clothes hanging on this line, so she's as well as her own clothing and towels and things like that, so she's doing the household cleaning. Um, we can't see the husband or the children, they're implied by these other symbolic scenes, if you want to put it that way. Um, what is there's a connotation of what's being denoted um, as I said good housekeeping is endorsed them they're an opinion leader so that ties in with two-step flow and um, oh that's a whole cats um, as I said the preferred reading of Stuart Hall of the Abbott's reassuring lexical fields so there are words like trust, truly, safe, miracle, nothing like um, that despite being a new product in inverted commas because it's been around for a while to be perfectly honest it provides solutions to the audience's domestic chore needs and it's modern and it's new and it's sophisticated and by the standards of the 1950s it was high tech um, right Okay, notice again, direct mode of address. It uses words like, no wonder you women. Yeah, it was, yes, as if it's talking to you. It's a miracle. Trust the wheel. Remember, she's talking at us. Right, there's a direct address. Right. I think that's a pretty comprehensive analysis of that. Um... This font... As I said, these are lots of different fonts on this. There's a thing called in advertising called um, ransom noting. We use too many different fonts. You should never use more than about three fonts on a text. This has got one, which is this handwritten script font, which is everywhere. It looks a bit like Comic Sans, but isn't. Two, this font here, which looks more like a century font, but like century gothic in bold. Um, and then this one here, which is more like this is like a, a, a serif font, which is a Times New Roman or something like that. So these script fonts create a sense of personalization and a more direct address. But they're also display fonts because they're thick and they're bold, they stand out and are easy to read from a distance, as is this. Whereas the main body text, which has got small, densely packed text which is going to be harder to read those smaller densely packed words are a lot easier to read if you do them in a serif font so it's better to use serif fonts for this kind of stuff than sans serif fonts all right i think i'll do more than enough there to be talking about
I'm sure there's some stuff I've forgotten, but if there is, we'll talk about it in class. So, after that long ramble, if you've got any questions, you know where to find me. Don't forget, I've got another video talking about the social historical context behind it, another one doing the introductions. See you in the next one.